This is FRM Part 2, Book 2, Credit Risk Measurement and Management, and the chapter on Structured Credit Risk. This chapter gets its name from capital structure, of course, and so in the traditional sense, you think of a business that has a right-hand side of the balance sheet that includes debt and equity, but then if you look at it from a financial institution's perspective, on the left-hand side of its balance sheet, it owns mortgages and personal loans and business loans and all other kind of loans. So this structured credit risk chapter is really a discussion on the risks associated with either you know issuing uh, debt and equity or owning or selling or engineering credit products. So if we look at the learning objectives, you'll see what I'm talking about here. Notice there's a lot of describe and explain. There is one, look down at the one, two, three, four, five, one. Compute and evaluate one or two iterations of interim cash flows. We're gonna head and we're gonna go ahead and do that in, in an Excel spreadsheet. And so that's probably where we'll spend most of our time. But uh, initially, we'll at least talk about some common types of structured pro products. We'll look at tranching, which is the French word for slices. We'll look at the waterfall structure and key participants. And then we'll kind of piggyback on our previous chapter on default probabilities and default correlations. And then the last few slides are pretty much descriptive and kind of common sense. So we'll probably go through those last slides uh, as quickly as we can. But you might notice that this slide deck has, you know, somewhere around 35 slides. So this is a long one and I'll try to get through it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. A structured product, you know, some people call them market linked investments. These are prepackaged structured finance investments. And so you think about what a financial institution has on the left hand side of its balance sheet. It has loans. Uh, other businesses, and including financial institutions, on the right hand side of their balance sheet have issued bonds and they issued shares of stock. But then on either side of that balance sheet, there could be issuances or investments in commodities and currencies and some kind of an index, uh, maybe even a commodity index, and then a whole host of derivative securities like, uh, you know, simple options and futures contracts, but also more complex things like swap contracts. Now, you guys have been uh, watching and listening to my videos for quite some time, you'll note and remember that whenever I try to make a decision in my own personal life and I try to teach my children to do this, I always say marginal costs and marginal benefits. And so that's exactly what we're going to do here today with these structured products. Uh, unlike the original days of your microeconomics class where you had to make this marginal cost, marginal benefit decision today, like whether or not I should go out and buy cereal or eggs for breakfast, you know, that's today. We're gonna to have to consider these over time. What happens when those benefits are spread out over three or five or 10 years? So of course, or of course we'll have to consider present values and time value of money. <clears throat> All right, that first learning objective asks us to look at a couple of different types of structured products. And I'm guessing you guys have heard of, of these before, so I won't spend too much time uh, describing these, but I'll probably try to emphasize some things that may show up on an exam. If I were an exam creator, uh, covered bonds, these are debt securities that are issued by banks. Um, that are probably have some kind of an attachment of a guarantee um, based on some pool of underlying mortgage loans. Now these are these are not too common, and in fact the uh, the chapter tells you that these are issued mostly by European banks. I think it mentions Denmark as a as a common issuer of covered bonds. Uh, but the fascinating thing about these covered bonds is that the underlying pool of mortgage loans 
remains on the financial institution's balance sheet, which means, which means that the owners of these covered bonds, the covered bondholders, of course, they're going to receive interest in principal payments and they can receive interest in principal payments from those mortgage owners, but they can also receive them from the general cash flows issued by the financial institution. That's why these things are not considered fully fledged structured products. Um, mortgage pass through securities, however, uh, are considered full fledged because the owners of these securities receive interest in principle based solely on the ability of the homeowners of the mortgage holders to make those interest and principal payments and so if you look at the bottom there there's there's the mortgage uh, the mortgage banker what does he or she do notice that i've got that arrow over to the borrower so those borrowers are the homeowners and those homeowners then make monthly payments to the mortgage banker and I've said this to you before, uh, you know, the life of a mortgage banker and a financial institution is a tough one because if you make a 30 year mortgage, then you have to go knock on the doors of all of the homeowners every month for 30 years to collect your interest and principal. Or you could just sell it in one of these mortgage backed securities and then you can worry, someone else can worry about making all those collections. And I'll, I'll show you how that works here in just a second. But notice then the monthly payments go from the mortgage banker then to the owner of this mortgage pass through security uh, who had originally made an investment to to buy those uh, to buy those bonds. Uh, these are off balance sheet securitizations, which means that those cash flows must be linked to the mortgage. Uh, the performance of those mortgages inside of the pool. Now, collateralized mortgage obligations um, are exactly what the name suggests. So these are these are mortgage backed securities that use uh, that have the underlying mortgages as collateral and the payment of the interest and principal to the owner of this collateralized mortgage obligation depends on which slice or which tranche that they originally purchase. And so note that circle point there. These tranches, they can have short or long maturities, cash flows that are fixed or floating, or almost any other innovation that financial institutions can come up with. So this is called a waterfall mechanism. And of course, if you look at that, you know, you have the senior and then the juniors. That's often kind. It's called the mezzanine and then the equity. And so I guess the water flows from the upstairs, then it flows down the stairs or it flows, whatever. I like to think of these as, as stairs. And, and at the, uh, to understand the risk, I think the better analogy is, do you remember when you were a kid and your parents bought you a slinky and you went up to the top of the steps and you rolled the slinky down? So I want you to think of it in terms of the slinky. How many times did the slinky go from one step to the next all the way to the bottom? And when it did, everybody was so excited about it. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, a common occurrence, but, but it did happen. Everybody was high-fiving each other. Well, that's what happens here if all of the mortgage borrowers make all of their interest and principal payments in full and on time and don't refinance their mortgage. So then what happens? You know, the top step is happy, the middle step is happy, and the bottom step is happy. Or, or in other words, the senior bondholders are happy, the junior bondholders are happy, and the equity holders are happy because the slinky comes down and delivers all of those interest and principal payments. Now, of course, there's risks, risks involved, right? The slinky can sometimes go over and get caught in the railing. But of course, when you're playing with it, it gets bent and sometimes it crashes and sometimes it doesn't go anywhere. Well, this is what we have to worry about here um, with default risk and prepayment risk and all these other kinds of risks with these structured products. So think of the damaged slinky as the reality of life rather than that perfect slinky that goes all the way to the bottom. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a great analogy or not. I liked it. 
A uh, couple of other structured products, these collateralized debt obligations. Um, these are here, let me swing back here. These are exactly like collateralized mortgage obligations, but the underlying assets could be uh, almost anything like an asset backed security, maybe a credit card debt, or maybe a car loan. Um, and they, they could be almost, they could be almost anything. Uh, structured credit products are, you know, pretty much identical, but they have an innovation in there in which there is a sequential distribution of losses. And so let me go back here to this waterfall or the slinky. You know, what happens here is that the senior bondholders get paid, and if they get paid in full, then the mezzanine bondholders get paid, and then if they get paid in full, then the it flows to the equity. And remember, there doesn't have to be just three tranches. You know, there could be thousands of tranches in there. I mean, it's probably not going to be thousands, but it could be five or ten. Um, but typically what happens is if, if the cash flows into the pool are the exact same amount that is owed to the senior bondholders, well, then there's nothing that flows to the mezzanine or the equity, right? But these, some of these structured credit products um, have a sequential distribution of losses. So it's kind of like the slinky going and then getting stuck and then, and then going down and getting stuck and then going down. So, so that's what's interesting about the structured credit world is that the, those losses then um, are distributed sequentially over some kind of a predetermined pattern. Now, let me swing back here to this little thing. Remember I said to you that these mortgage bankers and financial institutions, they, they can just sell their mortgages over on the left-hand side of their balance sheet, and then they don't really have to worry about going and doing all of this collection. Well, the way that works is through these special purpose vehicles or special purpose entities. And um, from a personal standpoint, I, I have to confess that when I was in graduate school, even in my PhD program, I, I never heard about special pur purpose vehicles. And maybe, maybe you're like I am in that the first time I ever heard of these things was back during the Enron debacle, which was, when was that, 1999 or 2000? That's when I heard about these things and I learned that these are kind of its own separate trust fund where you put a bunch of financial securities into this and then you take it off the balance sheet. And then when you take it off the balance sheet, you know, this, this trust has a bunch of assets in it. So you can issue some bonds or you can issue some kind of securities to a sponsor. And, you know, there was such a, a, a fuss made out of this, special purpose vehicle and the Enron being off balance sheet financing, almost like they're trying to hide it. Now, clearly Enron was doing something that was not consistent, not only with uh, the accepted accounting principles, but also, you know, probably SEC rules and regulations and laws. Um, but still, it's not like a firm can have a special purpose vehicle and completely hide it in the backyard under a big pile of grass. You know, somewhere there's a note in the financial statements that says, oh, by the way, we have this SPV and you can go over here and read all the details. Uh, the interesting thing about these special purpose vehicles is that they operate, you know, as their own kind of an entity or as, or as their own, own kind of a trust. So look at that, that bottom circle point. Uh, they are said to be bankruptcy remote because they are their own legal entity, which means that if the originator goes bankrupt, the SPV still operates. Now here's a slide on... Um, these different these different slices. So notice at the bottom, I've got the senior and the mezzanine and the and the equity tranche. And I want you to think about these three different bondholders. Let's call them these three three different people. They're exposed to different kinds of risks. And what what's happening is that the senior tranche holders they're looking they're up here and they're looking down and they're thinking how can I protect myself against those people down there? And then the mezzanine and the equity bondholders they're they're looking up from the bottom and they're thinking how can i protect myself from those people up there so we've got this inside of the tranching pattern we have these things called subordination 
or credit enhancements, which are the fraction of the collateral pool that must be lost before uh, that bond tranche can take any losses. And I'll show you what that means mathematically here in just a little bit on an Excel spreadsheet. Over collateralization, this is a really interesting concept. Um, uh, this is a provision of collateral in which we can we, we do the following. Let's suppose that we have we have a hundred mortgages in our pool, and let's just suppose each of those mortgages is worth a dollar. So so we have a hundred dollars. Well, instead of issuing a bond for a hundred dollars, what we can do is we can issue a bond. Let me just pick another number for seventy five dollars. So you got a hundred you have a hundred dollars in the pool, but over here the bond is only worth seventy five. So that gives you this concept of over collateralization. Now what's going to happen, and you'll see this here in a few slides, is that this over collateralization, it protects the senior and the junior bondholders from the equity tranche holders aggregating all of the excess cash flows from the fund. And you'll, you'll see that explicitly on the Excel spreadsheet here in just a few minutes. And so let me go ahead and define this excess spread. That's the difference between the cash flows collected and the payments made to the bondholder. So just let me go back to this thing right here. And so, you know, this is not an exact example, but you got all these monthly payments coming in and then monthly payments going out. And so that ex excess spread will be, where am I there? Excess spread will be the difference between those two. So let's go ahead and start our example here. Uh, and this is going to be the basis for our Excel spreadsheet here in just a few moments. So let's suppose that our assets are $100 million par value. And the coupon that's going to be paid on those assets is the London Interbank offered rate plus 4%. Now we're going to divide that $100 million into three tranches. And this should be an obvious notion for those of you who are looking at those numbers. The senior tranche typically holds the bulk, the majority uh, of the tranche. So in this case, it's 85%. The mezzanine or the junior tranche is uh, 10 million or 10%. And then the equity tranche is just 5 million. So it costs the equity note holders or the equity bond holders 5 million to get, in, to get into this slice of the investment. And note the senior tranche gets LIBOR plus 50 basis points, juniors get LIBOR plus 500 basis points, and then the equity holders, they get, you know, kind of whatever's left over. And that's why we use the term equity, although this doesn't really work like shareholders equity in a publicly held corporation. And I'll show you that here in just a second. But there's, there's, no, uh, there's no explicit promise, right, with the junior and the senior tranche. Uh, those bondholders get an explicit promise. All right, so that top table is the assumptions that we're making regarding this pool of assets. So let's skip down to the bottom table. Note that we're assuming that LIBOR is 5%. I have it bolded in red there. So what does that mean? That means that out of the 100 million, uh, we're going to earn 5% plus our 4%, and so that's going to give us $9 million worth of annual interest. The question then becomes, how does that get split between and among the different tranches? So we can quickly do the math. Five uh, uh, For the senior tranche, that gets us to almost $5 million, right? The mezzanine tranche, that gets us to exactly a $1 million, right? 10% of $10 million. And so the difference is 3.325 million. That is the excess spread. And what you're probably thinking is, oh, the equity tranche holders are going to make out really, really well in this example, but, but not quite so fast here. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And so that top is a repeat of the bottom table from the previous slide. And so notice the first block point. Holders of the equity tranche would receive $3.32 million. However, it might be less than that, and it might be substantially less than that because of uh, 
some securities are probably going to default in that in that first table we just assumed there was no default but also there has to be this over collateralization trigger and this over collateralization trigger trigger works in the following way so i want you to think about this look at you know look at these assets that generate nine million dollars worth of interest so the senior bondholders get about five million let me just round up the mezzanine or the juniors they get they get a million and so these are the people looking on the top of the waterfall right the top of the steps and as they're looking down at the bottom of the steps or the bottom of the waterfall they're seeing the uh, the equity tranche holders are celebrating look we get 3.325 million dollars and the junior and the senior bondholders are scratching their heads thinking wait a minute how did they get so much and i got so little what happens if there are some defaults so this over collateralization account is going to act as a buffer against future defaults and so what the what the senior and the junior bondholders are going to demand they're going to say look let's take some of that 3.32 million and let's not pay it to the equity tranche holders just yet let's put it in an account like an escrow account let's put it in an account so that we can have some type of a pool of funds that are paid to us in the event of lots of defaults um, now, the analogy that I, I think of, that's, it's not a perfect analogy, but it works a little bit like a sinking fund on, on a bond issue, right? That sinking fund is really just kind of a savings account. Now, that's a savings account used to retire the par value of the bonds at maturity, and that's not really what we're trying to do here, but it's still a buffer. You know, the, 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 uh, the sinking fund reduces the interest rate risk for the bondholders, right? And this over collateralization trigger reduces the cash flow risk. Now, collateralized loan obligations can be slightly more complex. And the complexity arises because they can have uh, all different levels of ratings from the ratings agencies. And so look what I have there on the far right. So the AAA rated bond, higher claim on cash flow. So they get the cash flows and the last loss of principal. However, all the way down under equity, that's the, that's the last claim on the cash flows and the first loss of the principal. And then if you put all of these different uh, ratings in between AAA all the way down to equity, uh, then it gets more complex. Uh, key participants, I could probably go through this relatively quickly. Loan originator, you probably know what that is. Uh, the underwriters, these are the financial engineers. You know, they really got their start, you know, going back to the 70s, but clearly in the 80s, financial engineers uh, created all of these different kinds of securities. And, you know, they kind of get a bad, have a bad reputation for promoting high risk projects but i don't i don't see it that way i see it in the following manner that when you slice these financial securities into into smaller and smaller increments what you do is you allow investors over here to buy those slices that they want that meets their marginal costs and marginal demands and in fact when you slice them into their different parts and there are more investors over here that are willing to pay for these individual slices, then they're probably going to be able to be willing to pay a higher price, right? Positive net present value and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so the underwriter is exactly what you know from way back in your undergraduate investments days. You know, this is the risk taking function. And of course, the rating, the ratings agencies play a big role in here. Um, I think the key element is the um, the second block point. Potential conflict of interest arises from the fact that ratings agencies are compensated by the originators. You know, the bondholders don't pay Moody's and Standard and Poor's. It's the issuer and the originator that pays these. So there, there's a clear uh, potential conflict of interest. That's why... Uh, that's why organizations like the uh, Chartered Financial Analyst 
institute, they're very heavy on ethics and ethical behavior and removing the analyst from those potential conflicts of interest. But essentially what the ratings agencies do is they evaluate all the cash flows coming in to the special purpose vehicle and then the explicit promise made of those cash flows going out. And so it's essentially, it's, it's essentially a, a credit risk evaluation to determine, you know, who are these homeowners? If this is a mortgage backed security, who, who are these homeowners? Do they have jobs? Do they have lots of assets, et cetera, et cetera. Now, remember I told you about the mortgage banker and the financial institution selling those loans on the left-hand side of its balance sheet. And then what they do is they hire servicers and managers to collect the principal and make those disbursements. I mean, they could hire somebody inside of the firm, but it can be somebody outside the firm. So they do lots of monitoring. Um, in fact, <clears throat> if the pool of funds has some potential or actual defaults, um, the servicer may have the ability to go in and kind of restructure those mortgage loans to keep them, uh, you know, from a, an actual default. Uh, sometimes the servicer can uh, take actions that are better in line with the int interest of the bondholders, and sometimes they can't. You know, one of the issues is whether or not that collateral pool is actively managed. Um, so we get another issue where there's a conflict of interest and, you know, essentially to manage conflicts of interest, you need a system in place from the, you know, the originator, the financial institution to the servicer and all of the managers, you need some kind of a control mechanism to be able to identify those conflicts of interest and then, and then remove them or at least mitigate them so that you know, everybody on this side and everybody on this side is satisfied that uh, there's no self-dealing or any kind of other potential problem that would expropriate the wealth from either this side or that side. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier uh, regarding over collateralization. So I'm going to go ahead and read that first block point. Some of the cash flows left after paying the senior and the junior bondholders may be transferred to an over collateralization account. Uh, what this does is that it will act as a buffer against future defaults. So go ahead and read down one, two, three. Any buildup of funds in the over collateralization account at maturity will be released to the equity holders. However, in the meantime, if there are insufficient cash flows during, during the life of this security, then they flow back to, they flow back to the senior and the junior bond holders. Now, part two there, this account is not going to just sit there idly. It's going to earn a money market rate of interest. And then, uh, uh, there's number three, it it's going to create a reliable buffer. I'll show you how that works here in just a second. Now look at the last arrow point. Unless the default rate is very high, there will be some cash inflow into the account every year except that except that final year. So what happens in is that over collateralization account, it earns interest, it earns interest, there's some more deposits that earn interest over time. And so those things then act as a increasing buffer over time which means that the junior and senior bondholders are less and less likely to use that entire amount, unless there's massive defaults, of course. And then whatever's left over at the end, then that flows to the equity tranche holders. All right, let's go ahead and continue our example from those two tables that I had earlier. And let's add a couple of things here. Uh, loans in the collateral pay no interest if they have defaulted at any time during the prior year. And the, in the event of a default, the recovery rate is 40%. All recovered monies are channeled into the over collateralization account. All right, here's the notation. And this is taken, this is taken directly out of the chapter. A uh, couple of important parts there. 
look at uh, one, two, three, four, the fourth circle point B, there's the total coupon. That's the four, six, seven, and the one that we had in the previous one, the coupon to the senior and the junior bondholder. So we sum those two. Uh, and then at the bottom, we're going to assume a money market rate of 5%. All right, so I want you to think about this. We have lots and lots of cash flows coming in. We have to ask ourselves the following question. Do we have enough to pay the senior and the junior bond holders? And if there is something left over? So there's the question there. Is the excess spread positive? All right, so what we're doing in using the notation is the aggregate loan interest, there's the LT, is the aggregate loan interest greater, uh, or I'm sorry, is the aggregate loan interest minus the B, what was that, 5.675 million, is that greater than zero? Uh, let's go ahead and skip to the bottom there. If the answer to that question is no, if the excess spread is actually negative, well, then this is not good news, right? So then the interest is not sufficient to pay all the bondholders and all of that all of that goes to the bondholders and the bondholders are not going to get uh, the promised payments that they make. Now, if this happens in the first year, then the bondholders are out of luck. But if it happens in subsequent years, then there's probably going to be some money in this over collateralization account to make up that shortfall. So look at that bottom circle. I'm sorry, the bottom block point I have in bold, uh, the accumulated amount that can cover the shortfall. If not, like in that first year, we might have to suffer a write down. All right, so let's go back up to the middle there. Let's let's ask answer the question. Yes, is the excess spread positive? Well, then we need to worry about uh, how much is already in the account, and that relates to what is K. So let's go back here. K is the maximum amount diverted from the excess spread into the over collateralization account. All right. So what we need to know is if the loan amount minus the bond is greater than that K, well, then all of that is going to flow to the equity bond holders. But then some of if the answer is no, then some of that is going to be channeled over into the over collateralization account. And notice those two circle points only only allow for uh, two possibilities. There are other possibilities in there as well. All right, one last slide before we get to this big old uh, this big old Excel spreadsheet that I have. We're assuming a recovery rate of four percent. I'm sorry, forty percent, and so we'll take that forty percent times the loan amount, and then to determine how much is deposited into the over collateralization account, um, we'll take that recovery amount and we'll add it to the over collateralization account. And then every year, look at the bottom, every year we're going to add the future value, that one plus R. Now the R in our example is 5%. So we're going to uh, multiply 1.05 times that previous year's over collateralization account. And so each year that value is going to increase and increase. So it's, it's really just a matter of compounding. And I'll show you that uh, here in just the next slide. I'm going to just skip over this slide really, really quickly because um, if you look at those formulas in the middle of the page, they might be a little daunting and you might think, okay, I'm not sure. Where do I do the compounding? Is there any discounting in there? Where do I throw LIBOR in there? Uh, I'm going to show you all that stuff uh, here in just a second. So let's go ahead and look at this example. All right, we're assuming a constant default rate of 2%. So let's go ahead and consider some of our assumptions. Number of loans in the pool is 100. Default rate, constant 2%. Now this is a little different than what the chapter suggests to you. The chapter has a fixed dollar amount of a default rate. So if you, those of you who like to toggle back and forth between uh, our stuff and the chapter stuff, you'll note that there'll be some slight differences in the mathematics, but that's because and I think that answer, I think that constant amount in the chapter was 1.75 million, if I, my memory serves me correctly. But we did it here, 2% default rate. There's the bond coupon, right? That's the 4.675 to the senior bondholders and the uh, 1 million 
or 1.0 to the junior bondholder. So that's 5.675. We'll just assume K, the maximum amount diverted is two, two dollars. There's our recovery rate. There's the money market rate. And we'll go ahead and assume that, just like in that previous example, that LIBOR is 5%. All right, so the loan interest is 9%. Now this goes back to that learning objective that asks you to compute some of these cash flows. So this table down here is, uh, is a legitimate exam question. All right, so based on all that information, and, and let's go back here. There's some notation, there's some notation, there's some notation, there's, all right, so all that notation you guys are gonna have to know, but it's all summarized in this table. So let's work our way through each of the columns, right? So time period zero, that's today, all the way down one, two, three, four, five, and notice all the way over, I'm just gonna scroll over to the equity flow column, that's a minus five. Remember from that earlier slide we had, what do we have? 85% was to the senior, 10% was to the junior, and then 5% or 5 million out of the out of the hundred million was the equity uh, was the equity investment. So that's why there's a minus five there. So if you're the equity tranche holder, it's going to cost you five million dollars to get in uh, to get into that tranche. All right. Now the defaults uh, to notice it's two two two, and I have rounded there because I mean clearly two percent of a hundred is two, right? And then after two default, you have 98 left. So 2% of 98, well, you can't have a fraction. You can't have a fraction uh, default. So we're rounding those all to two. That means the accumulated defaults then are two and then two it gets us up to four, then another two gets us to six and so on, which means we have 98, 96, 94. All right, everybody get that? So we go down after this five years of the security we have uh, just 90 out of the original 100 loans remaining. All right, let's go ahead and get into some computations here. So that loan interest, that's going to be the 98 times the 9%, right? Aggregate loan interest, LIBOR plus 4%. So 98 times 9% gives us 8.82. And then the 96 times the nine and the 94 times the nine and the 92 times the nine. So that gets you the loan interest for years one, two, three, and four. And then for that final cash flow, that terminal cash flow, uh, what do we do? We take 90 times the 9%, right? Nine times nine, so that's 81. So that gets us the 810. And then the return of the principal, uh, the par value would be, would be 90. So 810 plus the 90 gives us the 9810. All right, the excess spread then is going to be that column of the loan interest minus the 5.675 worth of uh, coupons made to the senior and the junior bondholders. So if you do, uh, do 8.82 and 8.64 and 8.46 and 8.28 minus the 5.675, you get the excess spread of the 315 and the 297 and the 292. What did I just say? 297, 279, and 261. All right, the over collateralization uh, amount, that was the $2 up in our assumptions and the notations. And then the recovery amount is just 40% of that. So four times two is eight. So that gets us uh, 80 cents on there. If you sum those two, you get $2 and 80 cents. So we are easily, so we had to do a little bit of calculations to get that loan interest and then the excess spread. But then the next three columns, those are pretty easy. And then the equity flow, all we need to do is take the excess spread, the 315, minus the $2 in that over collateralization account, and that gets us to the 115. All right, so let's go back and remind ourselves what this over collateralization means. What happens is that um, we have this excess spread of 315. So that's the amount available to accrue to the equity tranche holders. 
However, we have this requirement like a sinking fund. Remember, it's not quite a sinking fund, but like a sinking fund in that we need to take two of those dollars and put it into a trust or this over collateralization account. That means that the equity tranche holders are only left with only left with a dollar 15 and 97 and 79 and then 61. So I'm guessing that a great exam question would be for you to compute that equity flow that equity flow column. And so you can do that for years one, two, three, and four. And then we're going to have to wait here for just a second to do that terminal cash flow. So let's wait. You can see the 1091 right there, but let's wait. Let's wait until, uh, let's wait for just a second. And then we'll, I'll, show, I'll show you how to compute that thing. All right, so the answer to that question was yes, right? Is the, uh, is, is the 315 enough to pay i'm sorry is the 882 enough to pay the bondholder so that was yes all right so now we get into we get into this over collateralization account and so what happens in uh in that first year in that first year we put in the two dollars and 80 cents right so what happens in the second year the second year we take another two dollars and 80 cents and put it in there but we have to compute it. So get out your calculators and put 280 in there. So 2.8 and then multiply it by, now what's, this is like a trust fund, right? So it's earning that money market rate of interest. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take 280 times 1.05. I'll go ahead and do that with my calculator. Right, I should have that on there. So 2.8, 1.05. So if we multiply, that gets me 294 and then add the 2.8 and there gives you the five dollars and 74 cents so that's what you're doing each time so eat so to go from 280 to 574 you're just compounding that account at the five percent one plus the interest rate one plus that money market rate which is uh which is five percent and then that gets you all the way down to the terminal cash flow. If you put in your calculator, I'll go ahead and do this too. So if we do the 12.07 and then multiply that by the 1.05, we get 12.67 something something. So that rounds up to the 12.68. All right, so that's how much is in that over collateralization account. Now let's swing back and use that to compute the terminal cash flow for the equity, that 1091. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna go back and we're gonna take that terminal cash flow of the loan interest, so the 9810, we're gonna add the recovery amount of 80 cents, and then we're gonna add that 1268 uh, in the account. So that's uh, 111.58. But all we owe the bondholders in that last year is the principal of 85 and the principal of 10 to the senior and the junior bondholders, plus their last coupon payment of 5.675. That's the 100.68. If you take the two, the difference between those two, you get the terminal, uh, the terminal cash flow to the tranche holder, the equity tranche holders, 1091. And then the last thing that we'll do here on this table is we'll go ahead and compute the equity IRR. And so all you have to do to get that 29.79 is look at the equity flow calculator. So make cash flow zero and minus five, then cash flow one and two and three and four and five, right? And then just solve for IRR and you'll get 29.79. Now the next example is identical to what we just did on that previous slide, but we're assuming a much higher default rate of 8%. And so I'm not gonna spend hardly any time on this slide, but I'm gonna point out a couple of things to you. You know, look at the defaults, you know, eight and 15 and 22, all the way down, all the way down to 34. So in the previous example, we were left with a hundred, uh, 90 loans with a 2% default rate, now we're left with just 66 loans with an 8% default rate. So a couple of thoughts that you should be having. Uh, first of all, you should be thinking, okay, this can't be good for anybody. And, and of course it's not. 
And so I'm guessing that you could go ahead and work through the excess spread calculations, the over collateralization account, and then the equity cash flow. Look at those things. So you're, you're in for five million and then you get uh, 61 and then a bunch of zeros. Um, so look at that internal rate of return that turns out to be a minus uh, almost 90 percent just by the simple assumption of going from a 2% to an 8%. Now this, this exercise here has a couple of values for the exam. Um, if, you, if you have a default rate that's high like this, you probably don't even need to go through and calculate anything. Just pick the worst case scenario. Uh, I'm not really advising that, that you don't calculate it, but you know, in the effort of time, you, know, you might be able to eliminate some possibilities on an exam. Now in that, one of our previous chapters, we talked about default correlations. And we reintroduced the concept of copulas and we had some really good conversations about marginal distributions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one of the big assumptions that we've made so far is that uh, the default rate is 2% or 8% and that there is no correlation between or among loans. Now, the reality of life is that the default rate is probably close to a random variable, right? Some years are high, some years are low, some years are zero, some years are high. And then uh, loans tend to show something other than zero default correlations. So the question then becomes, how do we go back to that spreadsheet and estimate those credit losses for the various tranches um, if in fact we know that there are some correlations and if that default rate shows up as a random variable instead of just the two or the eight percent in in each column well of course the answer that we use pretty regularly is to do some kind of simulation and so that's what we're going to do notice there's a step one step two and step three so we'll estimate the parameters like we've done in previous simula simulations um, we'll generate default time simulations and notice i've got the copulo approach there and bolded and then we'll compute those credit losses and so you know i've said this to you before what did we just have we had a we had a two-dimensional Excel spreadsheet. But when you do these simulations, it's almost like, you know, not identical, but it's almost like having, can you see me come your way? It's almost like having a three dimensional uh, Excel spreadsheet when you have all of these different paths. Now, maybe a better way of looking at it is, you know, those interest rate trees that we've done in the past where we start today and then we have all of these different kinds of branching out as we move as we move through time to simulate all of those cash flows. Uh, e either way you look at it, it's still somebody who's way smarter than me and maybe way smarter than you is going to put together an algorithm so that we can do this uh, in a computer. All right, so let's take a look at this picture. This is interesting here. Um, what happens if we have an increase in default rate? So the probability of default goes from zero and then two and four and six and eight and 10 percent. Well, of course, the value um, of all of the tranches falls, right? If we have more core, if we have more defaults, this no way this can be good news. But an increase in the default rate is really going to uh, substantially hurt the value of the equity and that'll turn that equity internal rate of return from something that's positive to something that's close to zero and then something that is way way negative now increases in default correlation can bring about mixed results depending on the level of default so we can't really draw another graph just like this to give us the sense of uh, the relationship between the value of the tranches and default correlation. So we're going to have to kind of do this individually. So let's go ahead and start with the equity tranche. And notice we still have a probability of default on the horizontal axis and then the value of the equity tranche on the vertical axis. And notice there are three curves there. There's a green curve 
and a red one that's in the middle. I'm not probably not going to talk about that one too much. And then a purple one. And so think about what happens here. Let's look at the green curve first. This is a default correlation of zero, which means that uh, defaults are uncorrelated. And so notice this is a steep downward slope and then it kind of uh, it, it levels off so that once we hit 10 and 15 and 20 percent, it's still pretty much parallel to the horizontal axis. So what does that tell us when there are uh, zero default correlation coefficients, then as the probability of default increases, the value of the equity is really hurt in those earlier decreases rather than the later decreases. And the way to think about this is that those uh, default correlations being, being zero, that means that defaults kind of occur randomly, right? And so that's going to initially hurt the value of the equity, but then not have much effect on it uh, as that probability of default increases. However, look at the purple line. This is fascinating. So if we have correlations that are really high, like 0.95, what does that mean? That means that the defaults tend to cluster. And so if there are lots and lots of defaults, then this is bad for everybody and it's going to decrease the value of the equity tranche. But if there's a cluster of non-defaults, then there are going to be no losses in the senior, no losses in the junior, and then no losses in the equity tranche. And so that's why, that's why that slope is, it's downward sloping, of course, and the purple line, but it's not nearly as downward sloping as the as the green line. And note under uh, under the green line, you know, we're left with some value of the equity at the bottom. You know, what is that? Just a little bit. But then the purple line for high pro uh, probabilities of default, we're left with some substantial value of equity. All right, so let me go ahead and read the block points up there. At low default rates, an increase in the correlation um, has an extremely low impact on credit losses. All right. But as the default rate increases, an increase in correlation has the potential to significantly increase the IRR of the equity tranche. And at the same time, it increases those losses to the senior tranche. All right, that makes sense. Then. Uh, with high correlations, this benefits the equity tranche. It's going to hurt the senior tranche. How about the mezzanine tranche? Notice that these curves, uh, they cross <laughs> and oh boy, maybe they cross multiple times. I'm not sure what's going on there down at the low end. Um, uh, but these losses on the junior or the mezzanine tranche, you know, are a little bit curious. So notice at low probabilities uh, of default, you know, let's say one and two and three you know, one and two and two and a half or three, let's get up to that. You know, there's really not that much difference, right? So the green and the red and the purple curves, those are all around the same. But then as that probability of default increases, then the losses on the mezzanine tranche, they're exacerbated when the default correlations are zero and they're mitigated when the default correlations are high. And we see uh, similar but not identical things going on with the senior tranche. Here, let me go back here. So um, notice on the mezzanine tranche, our purple curve with uh, high default correlations result in the least amount of losses, right? But just the opposite holds true. So it's similar, but it's just the opposite holds true for those losses on the senior. So look at, you know, I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. Look at the, look at the high default correlations, the purple line. Boy, that, that looks like a line, right? So that's a linear relationship between, you know, those losses and the probability of default for high correlations. But then when there's zero correlations, boy, it's almost like it's almost like the senior tranche doesn't even care, right? Those losses are going to be, you know, pretty much fixed. Can I say fixed up until what is that seven or eight percent under which case then they. All right. All right. Just like we have that conversation 
when we're talking about interest rate risk, we talk about duration and then we talk about convexity. Now here we're talking about default risk and credit risk. We're not talking about interest rate risk, but we still need to consider the effects of convexity because of the relationship between those losses and the probability of default. So let me, you know, if I do all that stuff, those are those are not straight lines. I mean, some of them are straightish kinds of lines, but essentially they're curves, you know, some more curvy than others. So we need to worry about, we need to worry about convexity. All right. So look at that first block point. The equity value tends to exhibit positive convexity. All right. So I would probably memorize that. The mezzanine tranche is ambiguous. <laughs> All right. That's what we were saying uh, just a second ago. Uh, but look at the bottom block point there at high correlations all bond uh, at high default correlations all bonds tend to shake off the convexity effect uh, the convexity effect uh, that probably is the more important of anything that i have written there whoops didn't mean to do that now how do we measure these default sensitivities and we're going to go back to our conversations with duration and convexity on a bond. We say something like, what happens if the interest rate goes up or down by one basis point or 10 basis points? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna ca call it the default zero one. Now, remember in a previous chapter, we used the notation of pi for the default probability. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say, okay, what happens? What happens if the default probability goes up by 10 basis points. Now remember when when we do when when we consider the interest rates, we can go up by uh, 10 basis points or down by 10 basis points. You know, with the default probability, you know, you you start at zero and then you just go up. Um, and then if you're somewhere in the middle, well, then you can you can shock it and you can and you can go down, right? So you can go up and by 10, you can go down by 10, but you got to be concerned about that that zero starting point. So the default zero one, zero 01 can be computed. There's the formula in the blue, and that's taken right, right out of the textbook. Now look at that bottom block point. It can be shown that for all tranches, so all, so the equity, the mezzanine, and the senior, the default zero 01 is positive, regardless of the values for default probabilities uh, <coughs> or those default correlations. And this is true because equity and bond values decrease as that default probability rise. And that decrease is uh, uh, monotonically as the default probability arises. We did all that stuff many, many chapters ago. All right, here's the final couple of learning objectives. These are pretty much definitions that I'm guessing you guys probably know. Um, as long as default correlations are high, all of those tranches are going to have a degree of systematic risk. And that, that makes some sense. I mean, if all the mortgages are going to default um, and then all those mortgages default and they default because the economy is crashing, well, then that's, that's our definition of systematic risk. Uh, thinness, remember what I said to you early on that the bulk of those assets flow into the senior tranche. What was it in our example? 85%. And that means just 10% was to the mezzanine and 5% to the equity. So that's called thinness. So in most securitization structures, equity and junior tranches are relatively thin, right? Now the thinness then is going to affect our value at risk calculations, which then is going to necessarily mean mathematically, there's not going to be much of a difference between a 95 and a 97 and a half and a 98 and a 99% confidence interval. Now, remember our discussion back in the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model, where we can observe a call price and we can observe the let's just do a stock option we could observe the stock price we could observe the risk-free rate of interest we could observe the exercise price we could observe the expiration date right so you need you need five variables to compute 
the option price, one of those variables is volatility or the standard deviation of the underlying asset. Well, we can observe the call price and then we can use the call price as the left hand side of the equal sign in that formula to kind of figure out what that volatility or standard uh, standard deviation is. Remember, we call that implied volatility. Well, you can do the same thing here with implied default correlation. So notice the second block point. It is the value of the correlation built into the observable market prices of the various securitized tranches. So you have, you know, you have 85 you have 85 and 10 and 5. Let's just suppose those were those were the par values, but let's suppose those were the market values of those tranches, and then you can work your way into... Now, of course, you're not going to do this in 10 seconds on your financial calculator to compute that default co uh, correlation, but you can, you can have somebody who's really smart uh, program an algorithm to do that. And I think this is one of the last learning outcomes uh, learning objectives what are the motivations and so these are relatively obvious L lower cost of funding um, exits there's always some arbitrage balance sheet relief unique investment opportunity this is what i was talking about earlier the spanning and these investors can pay more for all of those different tranches and there's uh, marginal cost marginal benefit risk and maturity matching um, and then liquidity. Of course, these things uh, tend to have lots of liquidity, unless, of course, we're in the middle of the 2008 uh, financial crisis. All right, there's a bunch of learning objectives there, and we got through all of those. So thank you for your patience with me. Have a great day.